Good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I'm Tim Brunts, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And so I guess a little bit of way of back, background introduction. Um, so I come from an engineering background, mainly uh, electrical engineering, undergraduate degree, and a master's in bioengineering. So I don't know all Arizona State. I worked at Baxter Healthcare for a while on a transfusion device. Before just saying I want to go back to academia, see if I can take on the mix this far. So at the Case Western, did a PhD in biomedical engineering, where our focus was on developing electrical stimulation to restore function in the bladder function there. So Case Western has a strong FES, functional electrical stimulation program, across a, across a wide, wide range of individuals or uh, function types to focus on, especially with spinal cord injury. Uh, but then from there, I moved to the University of Pittsburgh, where we're working at the neural engineering lab, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but I was in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. So I also got to know my monitor a while through the KS from Michigan and did some continuing work there and based on what sensory nervous system as well. So then that brought me here to the University of Michigan a couple of years ago, where I am uh, part of a new wave in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, where a couple of years ago we became a joint department uh, with the School of Medicine. So for a long time it's only been College of Engineering, of course, but now it's, it's, it's crossing over into both fields. So there's new hires like myself who are actually we're running the medical school appointment, appointment as well. So we have two individual tracks that help us really branch out among both engineering and the school of medicine. Uh, and Ohio as well. So I'm also part of the Biointerfaces Institute up at North Campus Research Complex. And so we have a wide range of researchers looking at different ways of interfacing the biological tissue. So I'm just Start off by uh, so highlighting. So here's our here's our lab last fall when it was nice and green outside. And I'm really happy that it's starting to green up again here in the spring. We call ourselves the, the peripheral neural engineering here at Dynamics Lab, and the primary goals of the lab are twofold. Uh, so we're trying to develop interfaces with the nervous system to restore function, uh, but also to examine system level neurophysiology. So try to get a better, better understanding of the nervous system control of the different uh, parts of the body. In particular, we, so far we're focusing on pelvic functions and primarily bladder functions. So if there's any questions, feel free to let me know if there's anything that is unclear because I'm talking through this. Uh, in general, I pretty much focus a lot on the biology of our stimulation and nerves. So the four general topics I'll touch on, just give a background on just some ideas of what neural engineering is, uh, and go into some approaches for controlling the bladder uh, by targeting the nervous system. Talk about sensory stimulation to drive the bladder, um, and as well as uh, ultimately what we're working on here is the spinal fluid interface uh, for bladder control, and also examining some of the underlying neurophysiology. So, I just want to give a little bit of a background on what neural engineering is. And really, it's a cross between medicine, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, and neuroscience, where the goal is trying to interface with the nervous system to restore function. Sometimes we say things like pacemakers, or even essentially some of the original neural engineering devices, because they're just going after the nervous system of the heart to try to restore function. Um, so there's like one of the common things in Cleveland, the case Western, as FES, a functional extra stimulation, like to uh, control limbs, so they're stimulating muscles or, or nerves in the muscles to control muscles directly. So this example we get about arm control movement for our spinal conjugation. Uh, something that's getting a lot more attention in recent years is deep brain stimulation, which is originally developed for Parkinson's and tremor, but it's crossing over to many other types of applications, ranging from obsessive compulsive disorder to even obesity. Uh, there's different neural engineering approaches to restore sensation. Uh, oftentimes we'll talk about cochlear implants, one of the first truly successful neural engineering devices or neural prostheses. Uh, and that is an implanted electrode in the cochlea to restore hearing in the home. This device has been available for implants for several decades now. Uh, and even more recently, there's things like the retinal implant. Um, this second site device came out of the uh, University of Southern California Health and Land Institute. But uh, last year, here at the Eye Center, one of the first places around the country to do retinal implants um, on this device outside of the original uh, company developed in California. So then a, a very hot topic in our area is also brain computer interface. So the goal is to interface for the individual brain either with electrodes on the surface of the scalp, so the electrodes that bother you, or on the surface of the uh, surface of the cortex or the penetrating electrodes, with the ultimate goal of trying to decode or understand the individual's intent. So perhaps give them control of the 
computer or assistive devices. Uh, at Pittsburgh, some colleagues of mine had great success with this and giving an individual control over a seven degree of freedom arm, which means it was a robotic arm that was able to move through space and open and close, and she was really happy that she could do herself a game plan. That's a lot of stuff. I was teaching about 60 minutes not too long ago. But we're still pretty far away from the like matrix. So in my interest, what I'll talk about is more neural engineering for bladder control, for neuroprosthesis. <laughs> ultimately, part of the, my interest is that there's, there's a huge need for it. So oftentimes we'll focus on spinal cord injury patients as uh, often as typically needing help with bladder control. Um, there's a survey participated in a couple years ago at Pittsburgh where talked to a variety of veterans of spinal cord injury and asked them what their primary functions are to put their other store. This is, there's three of the examples of processing this, eight to ten different functions. And among those that even the first or the second priority, bladder and bowel functions are as important as often, or arm and hand functions are more important than other things like uh, any sensory restoration. But beyond just spinal cord injury patients, of course, there's many others with neurological disorders that need assistance with bladder care, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, um, people with stroke. And then beyond that, though, there's a much larger patient population with non-neurogenic bladder dysfunction. So up to the third adult women, typically those with multiple pregnancies in each population, um, maybe individuals with, uh, say, pelvic surgeries as well. So there's a huge need for this, but it still is not well met. Um, there's a variety of, from a variety of drugs that have partial efficacy, um, mechanical devices like condoms or diapers or can be messy or uncomfortable. So ultimately, as a the last ditch effort, some individuals that we have neurostimulators and devices implanted to provide assistance. Um, so this may be too basic to a lot of people, but I like to throw in this to talk about the neurophysiology a little bit because the complexity of it made chat designing, designing devices fairly challenging. So the bladder itself is not just a simple passive balloon, but it's more more intensive system, uh, more intensive system. So. In the lower urinary tract, my focus on the bladder, the urinary tract, and sphincter, so it's the uh, system that holds the urine and that external pathway. At the sacral level, the pelvic nerves provide parasympathetic innervation. Uh, there's hy the hypogastric nerve provides sympathetic innervation. And then there's also somatic or volitional control of the pudendal nerve, um, which comes down to the urethra. So you've got both the autonomic nerves, so it's um, involuntary neural control of the bladder and bladder neck, and then there's volitional control that we have over the sphincter as well. Among all of these, there is communication between individual spinal levels, and there are reflexes between each of the components in this system, as well as, and then each of these nerves has both motor and sensory components. So, a very simplified diagram, I just showed motor and motor, yeah, but really each nerve on both sides of the body. That contains all these components. And I'd like to just throw up this somewhat simple diagram because then I use it in later slides for other talks like when I test where electrodes are put in the body and kind of have a common baseline. So during continence, when our goal is to keep urine in the bladder, which hopefully we are all doing right now, uh, the sympathetic system is active where the bladder itself, the bladder muscle is generally relaxed and we maintain closure over the system. There's some sphincter tone. And there are genital nerve afferents within the pudendal nerve that can be activated and driven that can be reflex relaxation of the bladder uh, to make the continence. During, during the correction or bladder emptying or bladder voiding, the parasympathetic system is active and then the bladder is contracted while we relax our sphincters. And during this time point, there are flow receptors within the urethra that travel through the pudendal nerve, and they can be activated to drive reflex uh, bladder contractions. They kind of they often will work to augment or maintain bladder contraction. So I'll come back and I'll return to those two different reflex pathways: the genital nerve pathway that can drive continence, or this uh, flow receptor pathway that can kind of have a closed loop maintaining bladder contraction. So there are a couple of primary neurostimulators available. Um, Medtronic has their interesting device, which is based is very similar to the pacemaker technology, the brain stimulation technology, where the electrode lead is placed typically in the third foramen of the uh, 
sacrum, um, and then targeting one of the final roots. Sometimes it's done bilaterally, and sometimes there are multiple levels that's targeted. Really, this falls under the uh, neuromodulation that's done of sacral reflex pathway, where the stimulation helps promote and improve confidence and bladder emptying. But other than the fact that it acts in sensory pathways, the mechanisms are not well understood. In fact, this is a uh, fairly uh, non specific stimulation and it has, can have partial effectiveness in individuals where um, success is formed as 50% improvement in symptoms, which would be going from being incontinent nine times a day down to say, three times a day. Um, and you often will have a temporary knee placement where it's going to have a percutaneous knee for a few weeks. And if that's successful, like obtaining that 50% improvement, they get permanent. And even then, you know, the individuals who are first screened to those who see success can range from anywhere up to 30 to 75%. Um, Some of them are successful, they take for it. For spinal cord injury patients, um, perhaps you're familiar with this, is the Giles Brindley came up with his early device. Marketed by FineTech out of the UK. Um, here it was sold as a bulk care device for a while before being discontinued. And there are some both book electrodes that are put around the ventral roots, um, the motor roots of the coming out of the spinal cord. And this directly drives the bladder to help with empty and spinal cord injury patients. But at this level, we're already also closing off the sphincter in that the motor signals are going to both of them at the same time. So directly the bladder sphincter at the same time is not desirable. Fortunately, there are two different types of muscles. Um, so an on-off stimulation paradigm is used. The sphincter, which is a somatic muscle, just like the muscles in our arm, contracts right with the stimulation. But the smooth muscle of the bladder has a much slower <coughs> contraction time as well as relaxation time than the operator. And so it can lead to urine release during those stimulation operators. However, Fortunately, uh, spinal cord injury patients frequently will have reflex state of closure and bladder contraction as well. Um, so to make this device ultimately work frequently, there's a course for isotomy to perform, uh, which eliminates, of course, all other reflexes in the region and directly to the least bit the least among patients. So it's a really good And then recently, there's another device that's starting to pick up clinically. Urgent PC device in which posterior tibial nerve stimulation is performed, but basically an acupuncture needle placed near the ankle, and individuals might come in for 20 minute sessions on a weekly basis. Um, the same patient public cohort perhaps with an interstitial device and seems to show improvement in bladder function. The mechanisms of this are not well understood, although the tibial nerve does have some of the same spinal roots as some of our sacral nerve stimulation. Beyond that, it's still very different. So there's a consistency there, the growing area of research in which researchers are looking to get more specific stimulation of some of these endo nerve pathways that feed into the same nerve that we can just get targets, perhaps even more selective stimulation approach. So the general nerve, general nerve pathway in the genome that I talked about before is just pretty well established for driving confidence, uh, both in this long series of animal studies as well as uh, human studies. So here's an example from over 10 years ago in which spinal cord injury patients looked at for surface stimulation with the first film. Um, they looked at series of control systematic maps on the bladder is slowly filled and filled with the contraction, and it was just so hard to get at the risk of the bladder the And that's compared to some test trials in which as the bladder is filled, anytime the pressure was above a level, the stimulation is applied and then cause bladder relaxation. So eventually the bladder is so large that there's leakage. What we effectively have is a stimulation bladder size, which is a control bladder size, and generally needs to go larger um, effective bladder. But in this case, this determination of brain pressure is under capacity in your region. Something that may work great for the clinic, but isn't really practical for anybody outside of the testing scenario. On the other side, the goal of trying to also pin the bladder. Um, <laughs> Stimulation to general nerve for reflex bladder acceptation is less well developed. In fact, I started my PhD around 10 years ago, so there have been several studies that show that you can stimulate different frequencies and either cause bladder relaxation, so you have bladder pressure, and stimulation applied, or bladder excitation for different frequencies, say like 10 hertz or 33 hertz. Um, but the challenge still remains that you're stimulating on the general nerve 
trying to drive these flex bladder contractions, you may be driving sphincter fluid as well. So it's trying to target something that's inside the bladder, but not also the blood your outlet path. So before getting into some of my research, I just want to highlight the fact that much of what we do is also done in animals. Um, it's important to have an animal model that really matches the template as much as possible to the human scenario um, to get the most translatable results. So in, in adult humans, um, normal humans at least, as we fill our bladder with pressure, the pressure, as we fill our bladder the pressure rises while our sphincter tones are increased. And when we go to empty our bladder, there's a nice bladder contraction and still to relax at the same time. And then we can volitionally add the sphincter close the pinch of the middle to, uh, to stop, briefly stop urination. Cats are pretty similar in that they have a sphincter tone that will relax during bladder volume contractions. But another common model for studying bladder neurophysiology or pharmacology are rodents. Um, they provide a lot of excellent studies of that on the that. However, if you're at, looking at the ultimate translation or the ability to effectively avoid matching the human scenario, um, you'll see in rats they have an interesting bursting of the original sphincter during voiding bladder contraction. Uh, so the both the mechanisms and, and why this is actually happening is still under being investigated. So something about the baby that helps drive the bladder pressure contraction during the intended contraction is not quite a good idea. By the way, I would generally stick with uh, the focus on using the cat as a model to <coughs> nice isolation of the but because of that, then, I also like the fact that we approach at least the bladder volume on a reasonable scale. So as humans, maybe we have up to a half a liter of volume. Um, cats is a much smaller bladder volume, 10, 20, 30 ml. Um, whereas a rat bladder volume could be around 1 ml. And the filling rate we might use during testing, um, which and this is on a high end, we might use it to at least on the reasonable we can test the lab. Still, is a, is a reasonable gaining rate and volume that we can at least see with our eyes. That also makes it, it, it makes it a little bit easier in the lab. So, in my, what I did my PhD at Case Western, um, the primary thing that I focused on was to stimulate the dental nerve and try to get better reflex bladder contractions for the dental bladder. So, in general, the stimulation pulses that we use are kind of like a hammer. Just Hit the nerve with something hard and try to get some out for that. Um, the user skin device I mentioned before has kind of a 15 or 20 hertz piece of continuous stimulation there. And that can work great if you try to drive muscles to respond to the static stimulation. The sensory nerves don't respond to this kind of chronic um, continuous, stimula uh, continuous stimulation pattern. So, the thought we had was can we do something where the stimulation is changing or maybe at least bursts of pulses? perhaps mimic how the uh, sensory signals run around, the optimal fire and burst of action potential in response to changing the stimulus. And fortunately for us, that worked. Uh, so here we have a one third stimulus leads to a moderate bladder contraction, and using the bursting stimulus where, uh, so 200 hertz stimulus for just 10 pulses, so it's like 50 milliseconds at this fast rate, and then repeated that once a second, led to, in this case, a much higher contraction. Um, on average, we saw about a 20 to 30 percent increase in miles across a range of experiments and a range of stimulus factors. This, this increase may have kind of implications. So we did these experiments across, I think the paper was published was a nine experiments, um, and it's an interesting effect where some of them typically respond to what was done as a uh, Standard frequency range around 20 to 33 hertz. If we added a second pulse, I made a double of stimulation, that significantly greater bladder contraction. There was another group of animals that just preferred this lower frequency in stimulation to the outer, and doing five or ten pulses in this first instance was a greater response. So it's kind of bizarre to us that why do we have some low frequency responders and why are there some high frequency responders? So the next study looked at stimulating within the urethra to try to target these end organs directly to activate bladder drive and stimulate at different points in the urethra with different frequencies and modify the results. And, uh, I segmented the urethra using a proximal or close to bladder neck and 
this one or the outlet, and the middle region we come around the street is located. And a series of contact animals saw that the high frequencies like 33 hertz were in general excitable across the range of Eurasia, but low frequencies like 2 hertz were only excitable more closely to the bladder, and that's in the kind of middle and proximal region. After cutting the spinal cord and a series of experiments, these were all acute short term and slight experiments, I saw two key things. Uh, the first was that the low frequencies like two hertz are not excitable at all. So they're not able to respond to any point in your intro. And higher frequencies like 33 hertz are not excitable close to the black band. So I came up with two conclusions from this. Um, one of them we basically concluded that there's two different circuits that are controlling this reflex bladder SIP. Uh, one is originated in uh, the middle proximal region and responds to both stimulus ranges and has some <coughs> spinal or supersacral level control <coughs> at the fictitious center that center brings down. And then there's another one that's activated down more the distal end of the reflex back through the sphincter region, only responded to the higher frequencies and is discontinued in the state of the spinal cord. So perhaps the targeting individuals with spinal cord injury, you want to target this more distal pathway. Other individuals maybe the more proximal pathway to this well. Ultimately our goal is to can we empty out the bladder um, during the paradox. So the third series of experiments where I placed fine wires into the wall of the urethra. And my goal is to try to break the proximal circuit, get the wire out, with the stimulation and not want to also drive or have rules of current spread to the center. So I try to way to drag reflex circuits and not go off the outer pathway. So here's kind of my, my ideal results for three years where I apply the stimulation on one of these wires, place the new reflex up, and got a pretty solid bladder contraction for this model, uh, but no bleed. So this is but about a minute later, I applied one of those first patterns to the model. So 200 hertz pattern at 10 pulses, uh, repeated twice a second at, at the same stainless amplitude. We got a 30% larger contraction, and boy, the bladder empty started at a level that was above any of the same level So what it ended up with, in this case, about a 80% efficiency, which was, well, which was great. Um, so this is something that seems to be probably about a clinical like, efficacy level, where previously a lot of pudendal nerve stimulation would be 40 to 50%, 50 or 40 to 50% went into the lab. But a couple of drawbacks to this. One, this is a pretty invasive surgery. Um, two, the stimulation approach is only looking at the psychic bladder. It would be nice to have something that can also target the last bladder. Um, the third, you also have to monitor the bladder state inside. You need to keep stimulating the empty or you can stimulate to something. Uh, the other factor here is in this model of the cats, they about 30 ml weighted out, and it was a couple of minutes. <laughs> so that's a lot faster than that. So I moved on after my PhD in the University of Pittsburgh, where the research form of lab is interfacing with spinal roots, particularly dorsal root ganglia, um, for providing sensory feedback or the poison control <coughs> of um, so when we focus in the lab of stimulating the nerve ganglia, which is where we have flexions of cell bodies and that's the spinal cord, where all of our sensory neurons kind of converge together at each of our retrieval levels. And by stimulating these ganglia, we perhaps provide artificial sensations that for individuals to ramp the keys and have a prosthetic arm for them. Um, on the flip side, we can record from the source of ganglia to get an idea of what's going on in the sensory that we're dealing with working on the heart. That was that way of getting functional electrical stimulation for locomotion. We did a study and we could post the state of the land based on the reporting that we did. So, the nice benefits of the PRG, once again, is that they're relatively stable, at least compared to peripheral nerves that are already moving in the press, sliding around the muscle um, in the particular column. Um, and it's noted that you can have multiple nerve and you converge together on an individual level. And there may be some minimally invasive approaches to accessing the roots. Uh, for example, there's one company recently that's done an electrode that stimulates whole roots um, for pain control and spinal modulation. There is a percutaneous state, a percutaneous impact. So 
I thought this had maybe with the mutual point or pretty things and trying to give us some similar types of uh, interface with uh, grocery things that we're going to, um, as I'll discuss, improve the electric technology. So what's been shown in some studies in the past is by taking a, a few or a lot of microelectrodes, very fine electrodes, putting them into the lumbar ganglia, we get idea of the population activity of during locomotion. So we have here our bunch of recordings from individual neurons. So each one of these rows is called a raster plot, where every individual line is tied into one action potential. So the action potential for these lines, and these are different neurons recorded on just different electrodes in the most of the Down here at the bottom are four different muscle or EMG traces corresponding to different components of the DNA in your ankle uh, flexion extension. And hopefully it's evident that there are different patterns of firing rates in these neurons. And individual ones can be found in correlate with different parts of the site. So from this we can decoder understand the local motion. And then the question I ask is, well, can we do the same thing and take our electrodes, put them in your sacral level most of the nuclei, and monitor and monitor the or your that? In this case here, this is a cross-section for a feline spinal root where you have the dorsal ganglia at the top, um, cell body units first, and then on the bottom of the ventral root, all the axons are the histology right back to the So just briefly comment on the electrodes we use and something that we developed and we got coming out of the University of Utah, where similar technology is used to make the microprocessors and the phones and computers. So silicon-based electrical technology has some other elements to it. Um, and originally these electrodes were designed for being put in the visual cortex for a visual prosthesis, and they can move on to sort of the brain computer interface I mentioned before, the individual that fits for the receiver, the same type of implant that's put in the cortex for a brain computer interface. And we've got some other other different versions that they're developing. Um, and there's other companies that have say fine, very fine platinum wires that can be at least ten millimeters in length versus say one or one and a half millimeters in length for the Utah black rock electrodes. Um, so these are fairly invasive electrodes that are penetrated into the you know, cortex or the spinal roots. Um, but maybe it's possible to do some non-penetrating electrodes, which I'll touch on here. So here, at, at the lab here, well, both at the in Pittsburgh, but then what I'm developing here, um, is we'll do a laminectomy. This is a little bit of an extra exposure, showing the, uh, so the spinal cord, and then this is the L7, S1, and S2 spinal just coming off on one side. And then we would place microelectrodes inserted into those roots. And then here's our basic setup in that we have a multi-channel simulation recording hardware system which allows us to simulate the cord. And in cats, S1 and S2 is similar to S2 and S3. And it allows us access to both the pelvic nerve after fibers coming from the bladder, as well as the pepidinal nerve after fibers coming down from the retail sphincter and then other structures in the perineal region. We put a uh, bladder catheter in that gives us ability to both control the volume and monitor the pressure. Uh, so here, the goal might be to stimulate the pudendal pathways, which can then drive public nerve functions, or connect other to the spinal levels, like the hypogastric nerve that come down and provide that body relaxation, or report some of the adaptive pathways to uh, understand what's going on in the state. So at first, we were trying to see that we could drive Goes through gateway neurons with bladder responses. This kind of a little schematic up top. So in this figure here, um, what it did was there's a four by ten electrode that's placed in one gateway, and 26 of the electrodes are stimulated in a random order, shown by the numbers here. And then there's bladder contraction that occurs during some stimulation period for a very short in this case, it's like a throw. So the darker colors in this show larger bladder contractions where you know, the white has no response and then the dark red one has a lot of contraction. So a couple of things that we create. Yes, we can get pretty robust bladder contraction during short stimulation and anticipate it to be The other thing is that this is pretty selective stimulation in that targeting one location was not just blasting the entire room. In cases like this, like number four, where stimulation nearby and bladder contraction is not that location. 
to suggest that we get pretty selective stimulation pathways and not necessarily target unwanted responses. So in addition to controlling bladder function, we like to have a monitored bladder state. As yet, at least as far as I'm, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no clinically viable approach to monitoring bladder volume or angle for our license. We use ultrasound or catheter in the clinic. Uh, there's some research groups with uh, wireless implanted bladder, like that research with over the As yet, there's nothing that's clinically viable um, for people walking around. So we might try to, to record from a whole nerve, so the pelvic nerve coming from your bladder, but it's a very deep structure. It's also a pelvic plexus that you have to access. Recording from whole nerve fibers leads to a very small and, and relatively noisy signal. So I thought was can we put these electrodes at the source of the ganglia and for the individual neurons? So this example here is a bladder contraction, compression is high, and while this is occurring, we're recording voltage signals from all of our electrodes in the source of the ganglia. And so these voltage signals occur across all of them. Anytime this voltage signal crosses some threshold, We'll grab that little segment of time and we'll call it a snippet, but about a millisecond in length, anytime there's some threshold crossing. So this shows all the threshold crossings all that together for one channel in this recording. And anything that has a similar looking waveform, like this purple one on top, is considered to be most likely from the same neuron in this trial. So those are all actual potentials from one neuron and two other little waves. And the purple one corresponds to this drastic bottom bottom. So they're all three lined with one X potential. So this is the neuron and then two others on other channels. So the bladder pressure is fairly constant. The firing rate is, is relatively constant, just some noise. And then during the bladder contraction, we increase the intensity of contraction. And we're looking at several different constant bladder pressure intervals. The average firing rate is what is approximately a linear or somewhat linear response. We can maybe we can estimate the bladder pressure from the recording. Um, so that's when we reduce what we call the decoding of bladder pressure from the recording and the activity. So it's the same bladder contraction, action potential rate, and then looking at just a moving, a moving average of the time to the action potential. What we call fire rate in neuron for one neuron and then two others that have very many levels of um, how well they fit the data. For the bladder pressure, so down here at the bottom is a pretty noisy recording. It's highly likely that this is just multiple neurons in the recording and you can't differentiate among them. But there still is some information in here that follows. So you can take these together and put them in as a, a simple linear regression, which is just like y equals mx plus b, and try to estimate the bladder pressure from that. So in this two trial is the first half of the recording. Just took that two years and fit it to the regression in that we're matching the pressure coefficients to the pressure on the, on the firing rate, on the pressure coefficients. And then we multiply the coefficients by the firing rate to estimate the bladder pressure in the second half of the And it matched it pretty well in both cases. Um, certainly catching that full range of pressure, I mean, it's going from 100 <coughs> centimeters of wire or 10 to 25. But in scenarios where we look to, say, take a recording in one period of time and maybe an hour or two later, try to use our same model there, it wasn't quite as successful. Um, so here, there's a, the array is the estimated pressure using a model from earlier in the experiment compared to the actual pressure. And the baseline part is pretty noisy, although we did get the larger bladder contact. So if it was a um, somewhat noisy scenario, we might still be able to kind of detect it from that comparing to something not as good as we might do. One of the factors in this is that it's it's not really a linear relationship between bladder firing and non firing and bladder pressure. There's some hysteresis in there in that as the bladder contracts, this is pressure against firing rate. The bladder contracts, the firing rate contract increases. But once the bladder pressure reaches the maximum point, the firing rate falls off before the pressure does. So there's this extra component in there that gives challenging, challenging, a little challenging model. So one of the different ways of approaching is looking at the expert control systems to evaluate the use of what's called neural networks. And what this essentially does is just add a lot of extra terms in the middle between the neuron firing rate and the bladder pressure. And so far we've seen really good fits uh, for our measured bladder pressures that we trace in the background. And in this trial where we used a model from the an experiment, um, had a fit that was pretty nice in this case. And all of these, this is a short-term experiment. They were just looking at different 
about a matter of hours. So it's possible. So ultimately, then our question is, can we get a closed loop control of the bladder? Uh, that's basically the one that's going later, too. But here's an example where that isn't shown yet of stimulating and maybe providing relaxation with electrodes and the in the ganglia. Um, so here's a high bladder pressure, high contraction, kind of stimulation of the bladder relaxes. At the same time, through other electrodes that aren't being stimulated, but we're still recording neurons that correspond to bladder pressure. So there's a lot of active pressure, high pressure, and the fall off with bladder pressure as well. So we can, working towards putting this together and say, we know the high bladder pressure, turn on stimulation, and then turn it off with the bladder pressure to relax. So in addition to monitoring bladder activity, these neurons can also um, observe a lot of other types of toxic in the bladder. Here's 10 neurons across two different spinal levels, um, brushing and skin in different perineal regions. Some neurons respond to brushing one region, others respond to another in a different region, or depending on how much of a larger receptor field was, they respond to both. So what this is useful for is identifying potential heart pulse artifacts. So here's a bladder pressure trial that I did before, and there is a bladder neuron in which I have the firing rate or moving average of the spike action at the time, and it tracks the bladder contraction very well. Um, so during this trial, I pinched the tip, pinched the tip of the penis to activate the continence reflex, which occurred in each time and is indicated by these black bars. Well, that sensory stimulation drove a lot of general nerve afferents that fire very fast. There's a lot of action potential in response to that, probably a somewhat clinical stimulus. Uh, so if there was a non-specific nerve recording, perhaps something that's just recording from all activity in a total fiber, it would be visible or a bladder contraction. Uh, so because we have a selective neural interface, we're able to differentiate between non-bladder units and bladder units, uh, so potentially lowering the possibility of false positives. So in addition to functional roles with recording these non-bladder neurons, I'm um, also studying other parts of the ordinary tract or physiology. So here coming back to the urethral flow afferents that I mentioned before. Um, so in general experiments that they do, and in most neurophysiology experiments they done, how to use animals and an acute anesthetized breath. Uh, so there's a lot that we can learn from that, but ultimately the anesthesia can frequently depress the neural activity. Uh, and then use isoforms and after a surgery step to transition those drugs to alpha chlorose, which uh, at least does not suppress the spinal response as much as isoforms, but still is not the same as being in the weight scenario. So it's, it can often be challenging to get bladder emptying or sleep relaxation under, under, under any anesthesia that can be very good experiment experiment. And so there have been a number of studies kind of look at the urethral flow afferents and individuals will put a catheter in the urethra for sealing through a constant, constant rate and report the flow receptors. So it's not quite a physiological um, scenario. We had one experiment recently where it was a sphincter relaxing and got nice bladder contractions and actual bladder voiding, which is a little bit of um, multiple times in this experiment, and there was a little bit of flow that might occur during it. Um, so here's one of the bladder neurons that we've identified in which there was a constant firing rate during the low bladder pressure and then an increase in firing rate during the contraction. But also saw this one in the flow neuron, so it's assumed to be a flow neuron in the urethra, which only responded during the flow times. And then there were a bunch of other tests we did, and this neuron did not turn up in that flow from the period. So what's fascinating to me is that there were bursts of action potentials that occurred during this. Um, in this period, whereas the bladder neurons are just individual action potentials. Here, there are bursts of high firing rates. So, when I'm speaking, looking at the time between each of these bursts, which, which that we closer together and the space apart a little bit, during this flow, and the plot of it gets the average flow rate over each time interval. Uh, and she found what looks to be a very interesting relationship between the interval between bursts and the average, average flow rate of the interval. Um, something that hasn't been reported yet, and ultimately I'm hoping to get more of these neurons because it's so hard to find out one of these things. So both from understanding your physiology, this is key, but it may go back to our neurostimulators as well. So here we saw six to eight action potentials for about 80 milliseconds, and these first were somewhere between two and five bursts per second. 
where it's four or five bushels per second bringing the fastest forward. Well, this timing is overlaps a lot with the first few stimulus I've been doing before, where I had five to ten pulses in 25 to 100 milliseconds, so going 100 to 200 spikes per second, and I had one to three bursts per second. So I was, uh, I was pretty excited to see this suggests a mechanistic basis, mechanistic basis for the first few stimulus parameters I was using my PhD in the postdoc, and perhaps we can learn to change the stimulation pattern based on what we learn more about the underlying biology. I'm also looking to try to understand the bladder pain neurons as well. Uh, so coming out of our bladder, we usually have healthy delta or these myelinated neurons to give us a sense of our fullness and feed back into that, that bladder fullness state. There are also some C fiber or unmyelinated neurons that in general only fire in response to painful stimuli in the bladder. Uh, but after spinal cord injury, C fiber is unmyelinated neurons, they're morphology, at least how they function, they how they function. So they start to respond to uh, stretch the bladder as well, that's not very interesting. And it's this change in the C fibers resulting in bladder, this type of bladder dysfunction where spinal cord injury patients can have bladder contraction at low bladder volume. It's really mediated by the C fiber response. So it's been fairly well characterized in that you know, they're attacking the bigger mammals and then spinal cord injury animals. Clear relationship between the two. But the relative timing is not understood. So when does this C5 return to occur um, after spinal cord injury? And there's this short amount of time of sort of bladder irreflexia and then there's sort of some local bladder responses to reflex that occur. One of the drivers for this is sort of user spin device I mentioned before. Uh, and driving some spinal cord injury patients in general for long-term spinal cord injury and that's some bad responses. There have been a couple of studies recently that suggest that it has been not too long that the injury may provide benefit. If we have a better idea of perhaps the C fiber change that may be due to perhaps an early intervention or may assist in bladder, um, restoring bladder control, at least improving bladder control after final cord injury. So what we're trying to do is first identify these C fibers. Um, so here's a case where I'm using very cold saline, which is very clear in the bladder. Activating some neurons that we not see during the form of the same infusion. And the ultimate goal then is to try and identify and differentiate among our sort of bladder fill neurons and the bladder pain neurons, track them over time to do a lot of human studies, both in impacting individuals as well as spinal cord injury. And that will happen. And that's some of our lab just moved to last week. Um, a nice milestone in our first chronic of survival implants. And with the you know, laminectomy here and placing microelectrodes and spinal leaves. And just had our first day of season this week. Um, we don't know yet how many driving neurons we may or may not have with the potential of data. But we did see some very large batch potential, this is 400 microvolts, this is a skin, skin brushing neuron. So it's not particularly interesting in the second half, but it's very large. Um, and hopefully it lasts for multiple weeks. The other thing we did in our one trial so far this week, this five days after the implant, was um, I had not looked at stimulating in the ganglia to restore right and bladder responses. I did place some condemned nerve electrodes, which uh, were given to have large bladder contractions. There was a bladder pressure, turned the stimulation on in the gray, and led to a very large bladder contraction. Uh, and then we also have bladder voiding. So this, this red line here is wrong. Um, but what it can show is that we got about 20 mLs coming out in about 10 to 12 seconds in this file, which is much shorter than the under anesthesia results that I got from before. Um, so this is not necessarily novel, but it's something we've shown before. But I was excited to see that in a survival animal, I could get preventive nerves driven bladder contractions, and this was, um, I don't know if it's completely empty, because it ends up flat, it's not like it's empty. But the amount of volume that it came out is. Uh, ultimately, what I'm working for as well is a lot of my colleagues having great videos of you know, not even primates moving their arms or animals walking on treadmills. I love that we've got some video recordings of this and you basically get it to show voiding um, along with our bladder pressure and with our action pressure as well. So we have another trial also turn on the simulation, large bladder contraction up here over 50 centimeters of water. And again, the Avoiding is coming up from here to here, not as strong as that red line. So, you know, pretty happy 
with that, and we'll have to see what happens next week when we do another test. Um, so I just want to come back and highlight that. And ultimately, the division tortured the angular glider and neural prosthesis. Um, from an engineering, we think about having kind of a closed loop scenario based on giving feedback from where the state is and finding control signals for an output. Um, with our goal in this wire system, the electrodes here, it goes through ganglia, where the microelectrodes may monitor the neurons from the pelvic nerve, turn the action potentials into an estimate of the bladder pressure, and track that over time. And as the bladder pressure rises, if there's a point where it goes above some threshold, we notify the patient, perhaps with a pager, a buzzer, an app on their cell phone. At the same time, it also turn on a relaxation stimulus, target the general nerve aphid pathway, and target the hot, the activate conference as many times as needed until the patient gets himself into the scenario where they say, okay, I'm ready, and they push a button on their phone or on their belt or something. And that will then turn and drive the original floor receptor pathway and uh, lead to a nice um, fire engine. So through all this, can envision a same implanted system with electrodes and processors as well as external feedback control. But as I highlighted already, there are a lot of, a lot of unknown questions. Um, what are the best stimulus parameters for perhaps getting into some of this? Will these signals persist over time? Because as I mentioned, most studies now have done a very short term of the So uh, we'll just get into the five studies. Uh, even down as I've had mentioned briefly before, we can better electrodes in design. And that's one thing we're also working on as well. First, we need to better understand this torture game and that is also. Uh, so here's a cross section of the line final loop. Doors through the gameway at the top, spiral and eventually the back on the bottom. And in this case, all of these cell bodies are circled in blue. And the idea of what they're disputed because if we have electrodes to do them, they have to create larger action potential and we can see the axons. And a couple of students in the lab are working on different ways of quantifying the cell body distribution across a range of different samples as well. And so in general, it's starting to look like, you know, as has been mentioned qualitatively elsewhere, is that there's uh, a lot of cell bodies kind of more tackling the surface of the game. Uh, so this is a very thin outer layer that I've been doing. So there's just like the peripheral nerves, and it's been hypothesized and showed us a little bit that this sort of it, we can record from the neurons with electrodes that are on the surface of the ganglia. So we're working with colleagues, uh, we're working with colleagues at the electrical engineering department here to come up with some surface electrodes um, to be able to record from uh, without penetrating into the spinal loops. So there's a cartoon from Graham that's made recently in which both penetrating and surface components for um, trying to understand the physiology. But the surface part is really cool. Um, we're using a very thin substrate, uh, less than four microns thick, um, very um, thin width to the neural to the structures. So I tested this out in one experiment so far. And so this is part of the electrode here. You can almost see the three by three grid in the middle is up to this part, the rest of it's just out of, uh, out of focus in the picture. And just by laying this on top of the ganglia, in this case with a lumbar level, uh, we're able to get some single unit or clear active potentials for brushing in two different areas on the skin. So there's no downward pressure applied in the energy. So we're really excited about continuing to try to reevaluate and uh, um, modify this technology further. Another picture we did a few intraoperative studies with a uh, neurosurgeon who was in the spine treatment center during breaks in the spine surgery, breaks in a lot of electrodes off. So they were uh, e cogs, electrical cord, very on the types of electrodes. They were, were not designed for this at all, it was just something we could get to add FDA approval for PCI or E. And we didn't see anything close to this. Um, and that was, that was in case we had a little bit of pressure in the process. So, Really excited about how this technology moves forward. We have a little bulk press to a glider based application for even other things like global motion and other functions. Um, so, with that, we close and thank you for your time and attention. Um, many members in my lab, either current or some new folks, that work in different parts of this. Um, there's some collaboration across different departments. And we're also working on different, um, some of the different types of research areas. And then, in case Collection and Ken, who's my primary advisor, Cliff Dubb, my primary advisor, uh, and also now.
water cell. The study we're trying to understand changes in sea fibers after milk after spinal cord injury is uh, funded by a grant by the Milton Foundation. So I appreciate that. So with that, thank you for your time. Any questions?